Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 169th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Alexandra Levy. Alex is the founder and managing partner of Element Financial Group, a hybrid RAA with the Commonwealth platform that oversees nearly $430 million of assets under advisement for 170 clients. What's unique about Alex, though, is that as a firm providing both investment management and financial planning services and that in fact, she's been able to grow her revenue to be almost 50-50 between the two with a four dollars to $11,000 a year annual retainer fee for financial planning. And that she did so specifically as a strategy to combat the risk of fee compression by more clearly and art- separately articulating the value of and the price of each service. In this episode, we talk in depth about Alex's approach to financial planning and how she prices it with her clients the way she does a demo of eMoney Advisors dashboard in her prospect meetings with potential clients to show them the way she'll keep their lives organized on an ongoing basis, the way Alex shortened the upfront financial planning process with clients to just two meetings, but then conducts ongoing quarterly meetings with all clients in recognition that financial planning is much more about the ongoing planning process than the upfront plan itself, and how thanks to technology, Alex's quarterly meetings with her clients have increasingly become virtual, leveraging video conferencing software, but how the reduction in physical in-person meetings hasn't impeded her retention rate that remains in the high 90s for her multi-thousand dollar a year annual retainer fee. We also talk about Alex's journey through the advisory business itself, why she chose to start out her career working for a major mutual life insurance firm instead of a wirehouse, the reason she ultimately decided to make a pivot to the independent broker-dealer channel for back office compliance and other infrastructure that a broker-dealer can provide, why she hired an independent recruiter to help her find the right BD to work with, the partnership she almost entered into with another advisory firm for support but had to bail out of at the last minute, and the way she eventually found her ideal business partner so she didn't have to be a lone wolf responsible for everything and could feel not so alone in building her now jointly owned advisory business. And be starting to listen to the end, where Alex shares her perspective on why she thinks time in the business is such a major determinant of success, why it's so crucial to be proactive about networking early and always in an advisory career, and why she views the entrepreneurial opportunity of owning and building your own advisory business to be especially appealing for women who want to control the direction and duration of their careers. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Alexandra Levy. Welcome, Alex Levy, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to have you on the podcast today to talk about the challenges and the journey through our advisor world as we collectively face all these difficulties in figuring out how to defend our value proposition and pricing in a competitive world and and just figuring out how to structure your advisory firm with all the different choices of types of platforms and back office support, whether to tuck in and rely on the resources of another firm and to build your whole back office yourself and and whether to work on your own or with a partner. And, And I know you have a a strong partnership and an interesting firm that splits both services and revenue separately between financial planning and investment management. And, and, and I know that the journey of figuring it out, I'm sure is not, it rarely ever is a straight line. Yeah, well, it definitely didn't seem like a smooth, straight pathway while it was all happening. <laughs> And from what I've gathered, it wasn't necessarily a, a master plan. I'm going to come into the industry and work at this firm for a while and then go out on my own and then find a partner and restructure my business model. Yes, yes. That genius plan was not hatched until <laughs> I had actually completed the plan. You know, And funnily enough, though, again, when I look back, I, I feel like it all was meant to be because it got me where I am and it all feeds in the business that I am and has helped the success of our business today. So start us out of just like, you know, what was your original business world before you came into the the world of financial advisors? Well, I had a couple. <laughs> when I got out of school, I'm a, a first generation American. So my parents came here when they were 19 and met each other in New York. They were supposed to stay for a year and go back to their respective countries and they stayed. So I, you know, came from a different kind of culture and I went to college and I, you know, was working 
the expectation was, you know, get to work as right away and have a career. I was hoping to go to law school when I got out of school, but thought I needed to work for a few years and make some money. So the plan was Wall Street and then law school. Okay. So it's a very good traditional (laughs) New York City path. (laughs) Exactly. It didn't happen. My mother had had a heart attack and she was recovering and I just needed to get a job. I was you know, just out of school. And so I started talking to friends, my network, my 21 year old old's network, which were a lot of kids that really didn't know what they were doing either. And somebody was working for somebody who was starting a brokerage firm. And I said, well, that's what I need to do. And I need to get a job right away so I can go and tell my mom I got a job and it'll make her happy. And it turns out he was opening a mailing list brokerage, which I'm old enough. Many people today would not realize that mailing lists used to go out on big reels of sticky tapes that they would put on envelopes. And when I realized what he wanted me to do, I I said, you know, I'm not interested at all. And he saw that I was a scrappy kid. I'd been working since I was a kid. I already had a resume at 21 and that I was a finance and economics major and asked me if I would come in and help him. He was a an entrepreneur himself. He had several businesses that he owned. He would keep the tax and accounting function in-house and let the founders run the business. And then he also had a portfolio of commercial real estate that he owned. And he ran the finance operation himself for all these businesses and said, why don't you come in? And I figured, well, let me do this for six months while I look for a job. It turns out that I loved the work and I loved working with clients and I loved helping them bridge the reality of what they thought was happening in their business and the reality of what I saw was happening vis-a-vis the numbers, which were very Mm -hmm. different. And I also, turns out I had an entrepreneurial streak, which started in that business. I started bringing in clients through word of mouth to do taxes and bookkeeping and corporate accounting. Within a year, I was incorporated. And six years later, I had built a fairly large tax practice. But I realized six years in that, you know, 95% of tax is about yesterday. It's certainly a great knowledge to have, but I am 10,000 times more interested in the future than in the past. And I realized I really didn't want to do that forever. And a client of mine asked me to come in as a CFO, one of the top modeling agencies in the industry at the peak of the model, you know, model heyday. So I came in and I had opened as a client, as a tax client, I had helped him open New York and London. And then I came in as a CFO and we opened Cape Town and South Beach. And I ran all four out of our flagship here in the city. Did that for six years, but the way the business was structured, I didn't have equity in it and I would never have equity in it. So I was, you know, running it like an owner, all the downside, none of the up. (laughs) And I thought, well, this is also not a good permanent plan. I had helped him grow the business as much as I could help him. And I had been approached by somebody to help launch a media company with some project that ended up being a very interesting project, partnering a large retailer and several networks. And it was very interesting that that company backdoored itself public while we were in the in the process of doing the project. And I was sitting in an ad agency ultimately. Throughout those two businesses, so when I went inside those two businesses for those six years, my phone never stopped ringing from my tax practice. I literally could not kill my practice. People were calling me for tax advice, for business advice, for financial advice. And I realized I really needed to be back in practice. I had helped these two business owners, you know, build and grow their businesses substantially. But I really liked working with a diverse palette of clients So as I was trying to construct what that would look like, I thought about consulting, but, you know, a privately held business that brings in an an outsourced CFO or a financial consultant is really somebody that needs an in-house CFO and they just don't have the money to pay for it. It's, It's a morass. There's just no measurable way to help them out of where they are from that perspective. And that's when, you know, along the way I was sort of weighing those options, somebody had suggested financial services, which had always been something that was within the purview of all the things I had done. And I thought, you know, that it sounded like something that might be very interesting. You know, two things happened at that time. September 11th is one of them. We live in New York. I live not too far from the World Trade Center and my husband was in it. Thankfully, he is okay. But my perspective on a lot of things changed as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And then, you know, I'm also very entrepreneurial. 
So unlike, you know, you know, we are an all women firm and I was willing to, to get started. Somebody found my resume and asked me to come in on the insurance side of the financial services world. And Propose that I come into the industry through the insurance side. I, I knew I didn't want to go through wirehouse side. I, I, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to have a qualitative business, that I had to learn it. And I didn't think a wirehouse would be the place for me to do that. So I, I knew I would come in on that side of the business, but no knowledge of insurance whatsoever because you know, I'm a first generation American. We don't, there's, that was just not a conversation that was ever had. Not a lot of, let me call my stockbroker conversations in your house growing up. And their families and how they need to get through. And so I said, you know what, let's try it. If this works, great. And if it doesn't work, you know, no sweat, we'll move on and I'll, I'll figure out what this is going to look like. And that's actually how I got into the financial, the formal financial services world uh, 20 years ago. So that's been a long time since I told that story put my head down for six months and realized that I loved it. I loved, I could see a full service financial advisory practice from the very first day. I wasn't interested in selling product and I wasn't, I was interested in the capacity to build a practice where I could help people put together all the pieces of their financial life. And that's how that all started. So what was it that led you to like financial services industry, like coming into the insurance and investment side when you had been doing this kind of tax and accounting work all along. And I, I get it, maybe didn't want to go into one firm as an outsourced CFO because that gets a little bit tough. And, and as you said, like the, the people who hire a part-time outsourced CFO are usually the ones that have enough financial difficulty that they have to do that, which makes them tough people to work with. But you could have just continued in the tax and accounting business and giving entrepreneur tax business professional advice what what was the pull or the allure or the interest to come over to the financial advisor side in particular it it was the advisory it was it was planning for the future there is something quite compelling about being able to help somebody course correct and make changes that will affect dramatically their future you don't have the same impact in tax you know, somebody's very happy in a year not to have to pay a big tax bill, but you're not making a huge seismic shift in their future. So it's sort of that kind of literal effect, the 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 nature of tax and particularly accounting, almost by definition is you are accounting for stuff that already happened. That's what makes it accounting. It's entirely backward looking by its nature, right? Let's account for the stuff that happens and capture the numbers. And so that that backwards looking accounting versus forward looking planning was the the driving shift as opposed to like I don't like doing tax work, I want to do insurance and investment work. A hundred percent. I mean, I love the tax work. I love the analytic part of of what that was and being able to really get down deep in and see what's happening and and you know, that certainly influences the work we do here. But I'm a forward-thinking person. I, I'm, I'm interested in fixing what went wrong yesterday so that it can be better tomorrow. That's my whole being, and that's what we deliver to the clients today. So you mentioned like you were looking at how you wanted to come into the industry with sort of limited knowledge, not a, not a household that had a lot of, let me call my stockbroker about that while you were growing up. <laughs> right. So you, you seem to have some pretty clear vision in that you didn't want to go in the wirehouse route, so you you chose coming in on the insurance side. So what what was it that made you not want to come in on the wirehouse side, given the the knowledge that you had, and and made you decide you did want to come in on the insurance side, given what you were learning or figuring out at the time? A couple of things influenced it. One, when I first came in, you know, I still didn't realize what I had been already doing. You know, and the the idea of sales seemed like something that was not where the f- pure focus was on selling. You know, honestly, that was did have some influence, not all of it, but it had some influence. And it's funny as I came through the business, I I had a shift in my perspective that happened in those that first year where I realized that I've always been selling myself. We all do. Uh, I had a tax practice. I had to sell my ability to help the clients when I was talking to them, you know, and trust in me, I didn't realize when I was building that business, that's what I was doing, but I was, 
the formal training on the early part of the business and that anybody gets when they first come in, whether it's on the insurance side or the wirehouse side, that had a huge impact on me. It changed it, it changed my perspective on what I was doing. I wasn't selling stuff. I was selling my desire to help people. And that was quite impactful. And and that happened on this side of the business. So the, initially I think the shift to insurance was because I really hadn't gone through that transformation yet. And I was a little apprehensive, but I already knew I was a relationship based person. I was, you know, I wasn't a kid. I'd already run three businesses. I had built a practice. I knew that I wanted a qualitative business. I did not want quantitative business. I wasn't interested in nameless, you know, faceless names that didn't interest me and appeal to me at all. So I, I kind of, thankfully, I think rightly surmised for me that this was a good way to launch a business that would be a relationship-based business where I would be able to really work with clients and I wouldn't have the pressure of what I assumed I would get with regard to, you know, how you build a business in a wirehouse, which is strictly AUM. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And there's, there's certainly, in those days, you wouldn't even consider planning. That was just not happening. Right. But then I've got to ask, like you... You didn't want to go into the wirehouse world because it was you know, kind of concerned it was going to be a, a product centric, sales centric role. You weren't going to get to do as much planning. But you came in on the insurance side of the industry, which particularly 20 <laughs> years ago was not maybe all that different, different products like we, you know, you're selling life insurance or variable universal life if you're coming in at that point rather than AUM per se. But I would imagine still kind of landed and went, oh, oh, wait, I think I'm actually still in a, <laughs> in a sales role. I just, I just stepped around a different kind of selling thing. Yeah, I, you know, for some reason, I saw the, the freedom that came with it. You know, you had to hit, first of all, I, I accepted and, and sort of fell into the idea that, you know, that's what I do sell. I am somebody that wants to help people. And that's what my, my pitch is. And I knew just from looking at it that I could build, I had the freedom to build the business the way I wanted to, where in a wirehouse, I would not have had that same freedom, meaning I could take it in any direction. You know, they just care about. So at least the more, the more independent nature of being a quasi independent insurance agent was still more flexible for you than the, the potentially fully captive wirehouse environment that you said, okay, I, I, I want if I'm going to have to sell some, I want that version at least because I know I want to be more flexible and independent. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it's funny because it really, yes, but the way it happened, I mean, I started planning, you know, from the second I started doing it, you know, and the, but in those days, of course, I was doing the planning for free, but I, I was working out solutions for my clients. So I wasn't, even then, I didn't feel like I was pitching product, but I was very good at it. And it was because I was helping people solve problems. I was a seasoned business person already. I, I did come in with a market and I came in with a network and I came in with people who understood that I could solve sophisticated problems. And now I had a tool that would be better in some instances useful for them to be able to solve those problems. And through that process, I started my planning practice. And, and again, what, what drove me in through and into the business that we have now is the fact that the planning was always the thing. It was, you know, the, the, I, w I couldn't care less about the products. They were very useful solving some very complicated problems. And my clients were very grateful because they were getting that planning and that thoughtfulness while I was doing it. So so what kind of insurance company or role did you start out with? Was this a, a, a large firm, a small firm? Were you in a like a producer role out of the gate? Yeah, producer role out of the gate. I, I was, you know, thrown to the wolves. <laughs> I won't say it was a great training mechanism. It was, it worked for me. My business partner and I, who is all, we're all women, think that there are better ways to bring women into the business than the way it used to be done. And so we've worked really hard to help people understand there are different ways than, you know, a phone, here's the phone, here's all the people you've ever known. Good luck. And we hope you see you're here in six months. So we're really, and that's what it was. Which unfortunately is still what a number of firms do in practice. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's insane, but you know, it, it, the process of learning how to be regimented when you're building a business those days and anybody that's been in this business for a long time and has a successful business, you know, there, there is a skill set that comes from those early 
years, which are painful, (laughs) but it teaches you how to have a process, how to be thorough, how to, you know, there's a skill set that's born from that. I don't think it has to be as painful as it was then. And certainly, you know, for women, it's not easy. I mean, you know, you're facing a lot of other obstacles along the way. I was the only woman in the entire place. I was agent of the year, the first year that I was in the business. And it's the first year they gave it to two people. And my numbers were better than his. (laughs) So it was really, you know, you're 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 dealing with some misogyny along the way too. So you kind of have to be tough as you sort of get through all that. Interesting. Interesting. And so what ended up being the strategies or the ways that you were adapting to, to deal with that environment? Because I know for, for a lot of women that join, like they don't, they don't stay for a wide range of reasons, but part of it is certainly, you know, firms that have not so hospitable environments or, or outright misogyny still kind of baked into the culture sometimes? A lot. (laughs) Sometimes more than more than sometimes, I think, sadly, still. I realized I needed to have a network of people. I'm a networker. And and that's how, you know, how everything has always happened. And when I realized that I didn't necessarily have the support mechanisms that I needed close by, I mean, I was running hard, really trying to, you know, try to build a business, thinking of nothing else. But I needed support. My business was growing really fast and I needed to have a network of people. And so I reached out through every avenue that I had within my environment. And that often led through women's groups, some of the women's networks. And that, that's actually what led me to my business partner. The network was there while I was trying to get through things. And, you know, women, many women have faced the same issues as they build their business. And, you know, we're also dealing with challenges often that men are not. And not to, you know, not that I think men, they've been doing this a long time and, and sometimes the challenges aren't as deep. I think you know, in modern day life, men are dealing with more than they used to. But in those days, you know, it was, you're, you're working three jobs, you're running a house, you're having kids and you're trying to build a business and, and other women understand those challenges. And so what, what did that balance look like for you in practice? There was no balance. <laughs> There was no balance in the beginning. It was just running hard. You know, again, it was, and it's still today. I tell people all the time, someone will say, how do you do all these things? And I tell them it's not pretty. It gets done. You know, at the end of the day, you just have to get everything done and you have to try to be as efficient as you can and prioritize what you need to do. In the beginning, thankfully, I have a very supportive partner who my husband under, understood what was happening with regard to the business. I'd, I'd run a business before, so he, he wasn't new to the program. That <laughs> It takes a lot of energy and effort, but he was certainly supportive. And so, so support systems for you was a combination of, of spouse, of women's groups and women's networks, you said. Was there a, an organization or a group in particular that you ended up getting more involved with? No, it was through, you know, I was, I was an agent of one of the big mutual agencies and they had a women's network that they were loosely trying to set up internally that was connecting all the women in the industry. And I got connected through that. I started, you know, making friends and connections that way. And then it it went into, you know, folks that were in the field, people that were in the home office. It led to investment managers and, anybody related to the business. I mean, there are a lot of women who are very receptive to having a community and that ended up being really terrific for me. I mean, again, if I found my business partner that way, so, you know, it was, it was a tremendously beneficial (laughs) for many reasons. So I guess worth, worth noting or reflecting on like large firms setting up internal network for, women in the organization, so advisors, even advisors and home office staff and and all the women in the organization can connect. Like that was that was genuinely a meaningful positive impact and support structure for you. Ah, I think so. And and for anybody, any other women I've known in in the business or many of them, they have found the same thing. You know, again, when you're the one of the few women in a room, it's nice to be able to have some people you can call who are facing the same challenges. So you're building this practice being, as you're putting it, kind of very planning focused around helping clients solve problems, 
turns out when you're really good at helping people solve problems, they also actually end up buying some products that you need anyway. So sales and production ends out ends out working along the way. You're obviously not still at the firm now. So what was the path to to what came next? The progression of my business. So the my business was growing and I needed more and more support for the business. And I was trying to figure out exactly how I would structure that support. What would it look like? Always with a planning focus. So again, I was already doing plans, of course, for free. I wasn't getting paid for the plans in that business. And so I started looking at some alternatives. I ended up talking to one firm. It was you know, a firm that I, I think they were attracted to the idea of bringing a female partner in. It was five guys. And we were dating for a year. We were about ready to get married and they dropped a lifetime non-compete on me. So they had sold their business to NFS and they, they had presented me with a similar structure. They weren't actually buying my business at that point. They just wanted me to join the firm. And I realized that that was not what I was envisioning. <laughs> and I talked to one of my friends from one of the networks that I had built, these, these women networks. And she said, you know, you should talk to my business partner, Jonan, who was not my business partner at the time, but a friend I had known. And she said, you should talk to her. And she's, you know, potentially going through some changes with her, where she was situated. So I called, I did, I called Jonan and in about two phone calls, we decided we were going to build element. I told her plan B is off the table. I'm back to plan A. I want to build a business. This is my vision. And she was in from like the second sentence (laughs) and we were off to the races. So I, I, I want to go back just for a moment of this sort of brief aside. You know, found a firm I was potentially going to merge in with, dated for a year getting to know them, and then it blew up on the finish line. Can we go <laughs> back to that just for a moment? Because I, I just I'm I'm I, so I'm always one of the things that I've I've long been fascinated by, kind of particularly in our industry, are kind of people that come together for partnerships or or mergers or something of that nature and and the ones that that don't work out in some cases because people you know go through with them they end up going horribly wrong and i find invariably without fail when a partnership goes bad and you say like what went wrong was there anything that you could have figured out in advance to see this coming the answer is always yeah, in retrospect, there were some warning signs, but you know, I just I didn't give them enough credence at the time. I didn't realize their significance at the time. And and then there are situations like this where, like, yep, we we went through, we dated for a year, thought it was going to go through, and then on the finish line had to had to veer off to the side and didn't and didn't proceed. So can you talk a little bit more about just like like what were you doing? What were you building up to? And How did you get to the point of, hey, even though I've invested all this time and energy into this relationship, I just cannot pull this trigger? It's funny to think back on it because I can remember all of the course fine details of when it blew up. You know, I was desperately in need. I needed support for the business. I was at a juncture and I I really had to take the next step. I, I didn't want to stop my momentum and I didn't really have the structure to build anything. So this firm approached me and they had a planning function they were more deeply embedded. You know, we have, we were shortly after the formation of our firm, we went independent and left, you know, left the insurance world and the, you know, we, we became an independent firm. They were embedded still within the insurance world, but they did have a platform for planning. And I felt that I could potentially use that platform to help the clients and build the business. And they certainly lacked diversity, So that I I had envisioned that I would, and which is why they came to me, be able to make some change internally. And, you know, for a year we were building, I was building business. I was bringing a business in through them. And then we got down to the final, you know, negotiation of structuring how the relationship would look. And we had very different perspectives on what that would look like. And they... I don't know that they really expected that I would walk away from the table the way I did, which was that I did. I was, you know, I wasn't going to have a lifetime non-compete for a business that I didn't have a majority stakeholder in. You know, there's just no way that I would do that. And I wouldn't do it to my clients either. So yeah, it was painful. <laughs> it was painful, but you know, a lot of the things that seemed to be the worst thing that could ever happen ended up being 
the best things ever, again, in hindsight, because it did make me go back to what my original vision was, which was starting a firm that was advisory focused and doing it in a partnership that made more sense than potentially that one did. So what was the what was the pain point for the business that you were trying to solve at the end of the day? Like what was the what was the size of the advisory firm at that point and what what were you trying to to solve for or figure out? You know, I was a lone wolf basically. I was, you know, I was doing it all. I mean, it was, you know, early stages of, of how any of us run a, our business and you you're sort of juggling, you know, everything, you're wearing many hats and the business is starting to come in you know, faster and more sophisticated. In those days, I could tell you I was good with paperwork, but that's not what I should have been doing. And I realized that I needed to really do what, where my best talents were, which was working with the clients and continuing to build my business. So I, it was the first time I had passed a pivot point where, you know, I knew that I needed to build structure. And so I was either going to build it or it was going to merge in some place where I could get the structure I needed you know, it's funny. I look back now that business is, you know, I was a baby little, it was a baby business compared to what we are now. But, you know, you have these moments where you realize you either have to keep it growing or, and find structure or make some other change. And you didn't have interest in just saying like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hire a paraplanner and an admin associate or whatever it is and, and just start hiring the folks myself. Was that not appealing or just not quite economically feasible because the business wasn't that large yet? Like where, where was your head on, on just starting to hire and trying to build it yourself? I wanted, I did want partnership. So I had already run several businesses. You know, I had my own tax practice where I was a sole owner. I'd run two businesses for two other folks who own the business independently. I was at a point in my life where you know, uh, I was, had basically just started dating my husband, my, my then boyfriend who was going to be my husband. And I was building a life, a personal life at the same time. And I realized two things. One, a lot of people who own, I've, who I have seen in the past who own, who are solo owners, from my experience, they, they basically, it's a good thing to have another voice in the room. It's a good thing to have another perspective. You know, I, I don't want to ever be in a position where I think I have all the answers because I can't always have all the answers. And the best way to solve that problem is, is in a partnership, either one or multiple partners. There's a collegiality that comes with it. I, I knew how hard it was to build a business. You know, I'd done it before and I didn't want to do it all by myself. I really wanted to have somebody that was in it with me. So I didn't, I really, I hadn't found the right partner. I have the temperament to build a business. I just didn't have the right situation at the time. And so was there a particular skill set or style or inclination or ability that you were trying to solve for in finding a partner or, or just like, I, I just don't want to build this alone. I, I I want to have a companion that I'm building with and just kind of having a second person for the sake of just having a second person to be able to build with for, as you put it, to you know, ha- have more, more heads in the room solving problems than just any one. Yeah. I mean, certainly a finding the right partner is a very important thing. Right, a bad a, a bad marriage is not a good thing. So somebody that you know could complement the work that I was doing and who had a sa- the same sensibility. And thankfully, you know, I met my business partner. She came from a different part of the business. She does retirement and corporate and executive planning. We were a good fit. We weren't great friends when we started the business. We knew each other from a lot of events, we would go to business things together and we always ended up hanging out and talking. And I realized that she had a lot of knowledge about different parts of the business that I did not. And I thought that would be a great compliment. And, and, you know, we, we got along and that was, that was an important part of it. It it was, you know, again, I, I kind of had visions of a bigger business from the beginning and I realized that I need a better structure and more support to do it. And so how did you figure out that Joan Ann was the, was the right partner? You know, we, we had, we would meet each other at conferences and we would start talking, you know, the conference is over and we would all be in a hotel somewhere and we would be talking until the vacuum cleaners came out about different parts of the business and what was, and what we, you know, what we were looking to build. 
at the time she was, she had developed a program to help women get into the, the you know, distribution side on the insurance related. She, she worked inside the insurance company. She had developed a program to help women get into the sales force and, and sort of transition from the home office out into the field. And she was in the midst of that when we first started talking. As the program evolved, she had to make some decisions. And that, that moment happened right when my previous opportunity blew up. And I was on the phone with somebody who said, you should call Joan Ann. She's making some changes and this might be a great time. And so I called her and it, and it was the stars aligned. It was just the perfect time for, for her to make the change. So it wasn't necessarily a function of, you know, I, I've met this person. The partnership just seems perfect. So let's just blow everything up and go and make this thing. It was it was a combination of here's someone I've gotten to know and had a really good connection with for for years and oh now it turns out you're making a change and it turns out I'm making a change and since all this stuff is in flux for all of us at the same time maybe we should get together and and try doing something together absolutely which I'm 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 chuckling as I even say that out loud like <laughs> it's sort of the same path to dating. Yeah. someone right they're like you know oh yeah me and that person were friends for years but you know uh, i was on a different path and she was on a different path and then through serendipity you know we were both single at the same time and in the place same place and decided to get together and and you know and we've been happily married ever since yeah like yeah i just uh, funny to me sort of the the parallel and the style of the stories but but i think it does actually aptly accentuate sort of the the marriage nature of what it really means when you form a a real business partnership, which is very much like a a marriage with a spouse itself. Like there there will be hard things and problems that come up. So either you find someone where you are ready to invest enough into the relationship to work through the problems that inevitably arise, or or this isn't going to work in the long run. Uh, it, absolutely, a hundred percent. I mean, you you need to have you need to have somebody that you trust. That person can't be manufactured in my often, you know, it, it really, I don't think I, you know, I had to wait to find the person that would be the right partner. And I was networking and talking to a lot of people. So it's not like it was sort of a passive endeavor. Had you been networking for a long time, like looking for this or anticipation of this or was, or was it more you were networking in the women's groups within the organization for kind of just general finding social support and peers and, and, you know, some, some support for yourself through all the ups and downs in the business. And then later it was like, Oh wait, I'm looking for a partner. And I actually met some cool people while I was doing that networking. Let's, let's think back about some of them. It's a little bit of, a little bit of all of that. You know, I am, I am a networker. I mean, I think anybody that's successful building a book of business and a client base has that capacity. I like meeting people. I like putting people together when I think two people have some something they should talk about. I like making industry people, you know, networks in the industry, networks out of the industry. So I was also learning about what was happening. I mean, I was fresh in the business. You know, this was probably my, I was probably less than five years in the business, maybe four years in. I needed to figure out what, you know, I was also exploring how was I going to build a business? What direction was I going to take it in? You know, my heart is an entrepreneur and, and building something is always the first inclination, but I also wanted to be thoughtful about it. I, I had accidentally started my first business when I was 21. And so I wanted to be very purposeful in, in how that was going to happen, this go round. So it was a little bit of all of it. And so in the midst of all of this, I guess you were, you were changing or had just changed to move out of the insurance firm itself. So what what triggered that change for you and how did you make that transition? Well, more and more it was I was driven by the planning. So I was driven by the momentum that was happening with the business that I was building and my desire to really directionally take the business into a planning practice, which I had again, I had already been doing. I was I was doing the planning for free the, the entire time. And I realized that I, I really felt there was much more value in the planning than anything else. I, I believe there always was and is and, and will be. I think the future of the business is in that direction. The planning is the key. And so really looking to see how I could build the business on the planning side. So we incubated under the umbrella of an insurance-related 
environment. And then within the first three, we, I thought quite honestly, I thought we would be incubating longer because it was just, a, it was a little easier to do it than to go out a hundred percent on your own as we were building. You know, we were one of the top financial planning shops in a very large mutual insurance company. <laughs> you know, the planning is not their thing. They don't want to do planning and it's fair enough. And it's an insurance company. That's what they do. And so was, was the blocking point just at the end of the day, you didn't like this world where you had to give away the plan for free and then get paid on the implementation because you wanted to get paid on the plan or were they just limiting you from being able to do the planning you want? Like what was the, what was the breaking point? Well, I had started charging for fees already. So, you know, within the first, when we, the first year we started Element, we were charging for fees from the very beginning. That was part of the vision of the firm and it was fee-based financial planning. So we were doing it, but the support system for a financial planning unit was not there. That's not what they are. They are an insurance company. So we had some, you know, advanced planning teams, but they really, the compliance function in a, in a large entity, the lowest common denominator is what they're managing the compliance to. So if you have a sophisticated planning practice in a place where there are thousands of advisors, the compliance function is, is not necessarily going to be looking at your business in the same way, right? All they see is risk in, and they're not interested in the more sophisticated aspects of the planning practice. Yep. So we realized it wasn't a fit. You know, it really, it really wasn't a fit. We knew from the beginning that it wouldn't be. I mean, I thought we thought we would incubate a little longer, but within the first three and a half years, we we realized we needed to be out, and so that's when we left. Yeah, it it, it is a to me an interesting phenomenon, and and one of the I don't know, just the, the fundamental challenges that a lot of the large firms still seem to face is you know even as they become more planning oriented and try to give more advice. And and a lot of those large firms are even more so in that direction now than they were 10 years ago when you were making this transition. There there is still this mentality uh, that seems to permeate in a lot of large insurance and brokerage firms from the compliance department, which is still at the end of the day, they, they view any advisor under the system giving advice as a liability risk. Yeah. Right. It's not an asset. It's like, oh my gosh, look at how how much you know and learn and the level and depth of advice you can give your clients. It's oh my God, if you give them advice, we might get sued for it. <laughs> yes. Right. Like it's it's the the more you know about advice, it's not the greater your asset, it's the more your liability risk. And and that mentality I find still makes it very challenging for a lot of advisors in those firms once you get past a certain point in depth and planning that you know, they they need a culture attitude <laughs> shift around you know people giving great advice should be celebrated as an asset not not treated like a business less liability to be managed and minimized or mitigated absolutely i mean i do you know i i do believe it is a function of of the volume of folks that they are trying to oversee. Yeah. And so if you're, you know, running a business that's doing sophisticated planning in a culture where there are, you know, some people who are part-timing or, you know, who are not they're not doing planning, they're selling product, you know, and and their capacity is very different. I think that that is just not a good fit. It's a round peg in a square hole. So I, you know, I think that's the benefit of it is that it makes you, you know, again, for us, it made us progress faster. So discomfort has always been a motivator for change. Mm -hmm. It drives the change. So, you know, we realized we needed to be independent. We knew we were going to be. And thankfully, we did it sooner, way sooner than we had expected. And, and also, thankfully, ended up, you know, with a great partner. So what, what platform did you ultimately choose to, to break out to? We knew we had to leave and we had to leave fast because we just, our business was so, it was growing and had so much, again, momentum that we didn't want to take, we didn't want to make the process last so long that it would, it would be a complete distraction. So we hired somebody who got us a short list, a recruiter got us a short list of the six BDs, independent BDs. And we got on a plane and we toured the country and thankfully the first the first place we stopped was in Waltham, Massachusetts at Commonwealth, and that's where we ended up. So 
Out of curiosity, can I, who did you work with as a recruiter? Mindy Diamond. And how did that, like, how does that work exactly when you're an advisor looking to to make a change and have to go through that? Well, this is networking again, and it's very best. So Joan Ann had been at a conference and Mindy had been a speaker. And what happens for a lot of us women, because there's not a lot of women at these conferences, we end up all coming together. <laughs> and so she spoke with her and got her card. And when we were ready to make the change, she said, I just met this woman who was amazing and we should call her. And that's that's how that happened. It was all through networking. And so do you have to pay someone like Mindy to like do an analysis and vetting? Do the firms pay to you get get you on board and she gets paid on the other end like how does the actual deal work of working with a recruiter when you're trying to shop around your your practice it works a few different ways in this instance it was the latter so it was you know the the firms are compensating her okay. and, but i think there's lots of different versions of that so i i certainly wouldn't be first enough to give all the potential iterations but from your end like did that it wasn't a cost out of your pocket. The recruiter gets paid for where you land, but ostensibly kind of like buying and selling a house. Like as long as the as long as the agent gets paid something similar no matter where you land, their only real interest is making sure you land at a good place and pick the place that you actually want to go and will and will go to because that's what gets the transaction done and ultimately gets everybody the outcome they're going for. Yeah. I mean, though, I would like that said, I would absolutely have paid for that as well. And I, I maybe end up being corrected by my business partner. We might have paid something. <laughs> I'll find out later. But uh, I certainly, I think it's a, uh, an investment well worth making. You know, if you're, if your business is growing to the point that you're making a decision like this, I think it's super important get it right the first time as best you can. That doesn't mean it always happens that way. But, you know, if, if there's somebody that knows the landscape better, I think that's a great investment. I, you know, my business is financial advisory business. It is not a knowledge of every independent BD in the country. And I'd rather pay somebody for their expertise and then piggyback on that knowledge to make the choice that's right for me. Oh, and it strikes me, the kind of the realm of recruiting for payment for for platforms i find is at least to me surprisingly not used very often within the industry it happens a lot i think when advisors are at wirehouses and breaking out because the wirehouse often environment is often very insulated from the rest of the independent broker dealer world so you may just literally not know what's out there if you've never been to conferences outside of the you know the parent company just don't literally don't know what the choices are but you know, recruiters exist in the independent broker dealer realm as well for folks that are switching broker dealers or from the insurance channel to the broker dealer channel that I find are not used very often, despite it, as you noted, like there's there's a whole lot of broker dealers out there and most of us are not in the business of screening and vetting and evaluating broker dealers. We're in the business of serving our clients and being advisors. I mean, that's what we pitch our clients, right? Is is, you know, you want to delegate the research and analysis so that you can get the knowledge you need. And that's that's what we do for our clients. So I, I certainly feel like I should walk the walk. <laughs> so so what was it that made Commonwealth the desired choice as opposed to the uh the other half dozen that you were looking at? Like what what were what was the deciding factor as you're trying to figure out what what broker dealer to join? Culturally it was the right fit. That was very evident. They were and are very receptive to a more sophisticated business with regard to the planning piece and, you know, all different aspects of the business, the depth of research and the service that they extended even from the very beginning really was part of the process. We just felt comfortable. We knew from the beginning that it was going to be a good home for us. And out of curiosity, were you looking at the RIA channel as well at that point, if you were trying to do more work and charging fees for planning? I think that it's fantastic. We have one notable obstacle as we build our business, especially a business that is being built from the ground up, and that's that we sit in the middle of Manhattan. <laughs> so when you build a business in the middle of Manhattan, your overhead constraints are different than they are in a lot of other places. I think both coasts and a couple of other cities may have the same issues. So those, you know, those considerations are some things that we that were very important as we were working through what this would look like. 
And so like were broker dealers providing things like office space and rent support? Was that part of the equation then for you? No, no. It was the compliance function, right? So if we actually did do, you know, become an independent RIA, you know, that that brings in another host of issues that we have to deal with and we have to do all that on an, on New York based salaries. So if we, you know, eventually got big enough and we'd have RAs, we need attorneys in here and and we were still building out our core staff. And so for us, it made sense to partner with Commonwealth. At some point, we may end up going down that route in some sort of hybrid form. I think we will always continue to have our relationship with Commonwealth. It's been a great partnership. We're very happy with the setup the way we have it now. But of course, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Things might change. I think right. we would always continue to be affiliated with Commonwealth because of the resources they, they avail to us. Well, and I know uh, Commonwealth is a firm that's actually rolled out not not only hybrid options, but an actual RIA platform for advisors that want to sit on the RIA side as well. Right. And just don't, don't want to deal with the rest of the overhead structure. Right. So that, and that's, that's, you know, a consideration potentially for the future. That's all new. You know, again, we've been with the Commonwealth since I think we rolled out in 2011. So this, these developments are all happening fast and furious with regard to right. the flexibility in the RA space. When we, when we started, it, it was, there was a different consideration and, and most of it would be human capital, like just the cost of being able to do that and the overhead costs, which Manhattan rents are not inconsequential. Yes. Staff costs in New York are not inconsequential. So, you know, there were a lot of things we needed, to, a lot of boxes we needed to check to get the business going. So what is the, what is the advisory business look like today? What's the, what's the size of the firm and what's the structure of it? So size of the firm, we have about $250 million in traditional assets under management. That's, that's the asset that's under management. Fees come in separately. We have some non-traditional programs that Jonan has on the corporate and executive benefits side that are about $180 million. About 45% of our compensation is coming from flat fees for advisory for financial planning. So we, we charge a flat fee for financial planning. It's not a prerequisite that we manage the assets of the clients that we plan for. You know, we tell them if you have somebody that you trust and you want to stay with or you're a self-director and you want another set of eyes, we will accommodate. We'll figure out how to help you, whether it's oversight or whether it's, you know, just giving you some guidance. A lot of folks do ask us to manage the money that they have accumulated. And if they do, we charge a fee for that separately. So I'm a very big believer in separating the fees from the asset management fees, the planning fees are a value in and of themselves. And I think it's very important that the clients understand that. In addition, again, we're in Manhattan, where our fee compression is alive and well. We are in a very competitive market. And this helps me deliver the value of the planning to the client without having to cannibalize what I'm doing on the investment management side at the same time. Meaning I can charge a, a full-valued fee for the investment management for what I do on the investment management side and separately be able to charge planning for the work that I do for planning and be compensated for both because I'm pricing both separately and charging for both separately. Correct. Correct. And so what does that planning fee structure look like? Like what, what kinds of fees do you charge? What's the level that you set on them? Our fees start at four thousand dollars. They can go up for the individuals to ten or eleven thousand per year. It's an annual renewable fee. They get us on deck for twelve months on the fee. We have a very high retention ratio. It's in the high nineties for our financial planning clients, so they stay with us. We see our clients a minimum of four times a year, and I see that I say that word "see" loosely. In the early days, we actually sat with all of our clients four times a year. As we've grown and we're trying to build out scale and also accommodate sort of a new reality, we're touching our clients four times a year on a regular schedule. It could be meetings, it could be phone calls, and it could be video conference, which tells you how old I am because I don't think anybody actually says the word video conference anymore. But there you go. <laughs> it works. We all get we all get a sense of it. Got it. <laughs> So there's a there's a there's a camera thing. We both talk to it. Yes. Got it. Got it. And so 
four to four to ten, four to eleven thousand dollar fees, seeing or touching clients four times a year. So I got a couple of questions about this. I guess first, like what what determines where someone is in the range between four and eleven thousand dollars? Because it's a it's a healthy sized range. It really is about where they are in the continuum. So we have some specialties and industries here. We work with we have a, uh, we're known for working in entertainment, film, fashion, fine arts. We have another bucket of clients, descriptors. They're equity participants in law firms and accounting firms, consulting firms. We refer a lot of business out. They see the work that we do and that our clients are great and amazing. So we will only work with nice clients and they want to be clients too. So they come in. We have privately held business owners. I've run or own privately held business my entire career, paired with a tax background. That's a pretty powerful combination. And then we have a reputation in the tech world. We're uh, advisors of choice at some of the big technology firms, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, to name a few. And they sort of operate like the creatives and the analytics. They are sort of operating on both, both sides of the lobe. So part of the fee range is just kind of Clients in different industries have both different financial wherewithal and different economic realities. Clients in film and fashion might be four and five thousand dollar clients. Privately held business owners might be ten and eleven thousand dollar clients. Is it is it that kind of split? It's not really. It's more about where they are in their life. We don't have a minimum net worth and income as a barometer. It has to make sense for them to pay a fee. So we work with people across these industries, and what we're looking to do is, is see, okay. Will there be, or is there value today for the fee? Where are you in the sort of spectrum of your life? And how much work is that going to take for us to accommodate what I anticipate the needs are going to be? So it allows us to have a multi generational client base. Our clients can be young couples who are working in tech, who are starting out life in New York and have an expectation that they're. Life is going to get more complicated and sophisticated over time. They're trying to figure out how to deal with stock options, how to buy their first home, how they're, what they're going to do for school in a city where private school could be very expensive, if that's your choice, to people that are in the middle part of their life. Kids are going to college. They're in a transition work-wise to folks that are trying to give it away. And so the fee range is based on where they are in the continuum of their life and how sophisticated I think things are going to be. Largely, you know, you can use income and net worth as a barometer of where the fee might be. So the more income you have or the more net worth you have, your fee will probably be on the higher end of the scale. And and is there a, a target, at least that you set of a percentage of their income or a percentage of their net worth? Like, I'm just trying to understand, like, how do you how do you figure out or any other advisor in the firm figure out whether they're sitting across from a, a $5,000 client or a $9,000 client? We have a whole process for how somebody onboards. So typically, many of the clients come through either direct referrals from clients or referral networks, and they will either call for a short phone call, but all clients have a first meeting with me. And in that meeting or somebody in the firm, we sit down with them. I'm generally doing the first meetings most of the time. I'm explaining who we are, what we do, showing them our process. We use some technology. We use e-money, so I'll walk them through a demo. And we'll talk about wh- what's happening with them, where they are, and, and what they're looking for. In the process of that, I'm doing a broad analysis of income and net worth. So I, I you know, prepare them on the way in that we're going to have a conversation. And if they're comfortable, I'm going to ask them their income and their net worth, some of the things they're thinking about, why they picked the phone up, why they came to see me. And by the end of that meeting, I I have a very good sense. The meeting's generally an hour of where they are and what they need, and the fee is set then. And it's ultimately just some combination of what do I think will be affordable to them based on their income and net worth, and how much work and complexity do I think this client's going to end up being for me at the end of the day? Yeah. And it's, you know, I've read some of your work on setting fees. I'm just always fascinated how (laughs) people do it. Everyone has their own process. That's why I'm curious. A lot of what you said is true, right? It's like in the beginning, I I recently did a speaking gig and I was talking about this to a group of advisors and confidence, right? In the beginning, you are undercharging yourself, right? And, And you have to bring yourself up to where you feel comfortable and what you feel is market rate or, or where you feel the fee might be set correctly. For me, 
I'm also looking for something that will give continuity. I'm not interested in having clients come for a year, pay a fee, and then go. And I'm not just an asset aggregator. So it's not like I want to do the plan so I can get the money and then they can go, right? So the, the, the planning is something that's very important to who we are. I, I, I think there's something quite noble about planning and all of us here love that work and it's the work we want to be in. So I want to find the, the fee that's going to be sustainable for a client to pay year in and year out, right? Again, our, re- our retention ratios are in the high 90s. So for me, it's the tension point of where I'm getting enough compensation to, to, you know, that, that will make sense for the business, but will also be sustainable and the client will continue to pay for five, 10, 15 years. Interesting. I, I like the way you frame that, that you're, that you're trying to find quote that, that tension point between what, what am I going to charge that's economical for the business? And what am I going to charge that is sustainable for the client, right? In the simple sense, like, Hey, I can, I can charge my clients like a hundred dollars a year and do a ton of work. And like, they'll all stay. Cause I'm grossly undercharging myself. You know, I can charge the highest fee that I can think of that feels great for my self-worth except I don't end up with any clients because they can't afford it or they only do it once, but then they don't sustain as clients because they couldn't afford it on an ongoing basis. And as you put it, finding that tension point of enough compensation for the business, but manageable and sustainable for the client is, is kind of a balancing point. Very much so. And so for clients that are paying these you know, four to $11,000 fees, investment management stuff charged separately. What do they get? What do you, what do you do for to $11,000 planning fee? So we, we have a process when somebody on boards, we have a first meeting where we go deep dive into where they are and how they got there. The easy stuff is, you know, their financial profile. That's easy. I can get that through asset aggregation and through statements. The emotional part is is a big factor in, in what we're looking at. My job is to get in their head, to instill trust so that they will tell me what it is they want in the future so that we can help build that future for them. It has a financial tail to it. So we spend a lot of time. That's probably the most important meeting we have with our clients. We take that information we have, again, we use e-money, so we're getting aggregation, we're getting details on their financial life. And we write a hardbound financial plan, which we deliver in a meeting, and we address the things they were worried about, the things we identified as some issues that they might need to take care of. And we make some decisions by the end of that meeting about what, what needs to happen, you know, a, a plan of action moving forward based on the priorities that the client has. At the end of that meeting... I I tell everybody we have this terrific, beautiful financial plan, but by the end of the meeting, the plan is outdated and irrelevant because we're making change and we're living in the real world. You know, 99% of the plans any person has ever had in their life have not turned out the way they expected them to. It's not a straight line. So our job... Nor is it building our own businesses as advisors. (laughs) Exactly. So from that point forward, we're living in the real world. We're addressing the issues that were identified on the onset and some of the big concerns that our clients have. And then every three months, we're knocking on the door of their lives and asking them to shut everything out, all the noise, and sit down and look at where they are and what's happening, what changes need to be made based on what's happening in their life. And we're addressing those issues. So, you know, I think, you know, I think there's, again, three reasons that the clients stay with us. One, that we're good, damn good at what we do. Two, that we're nice people and we only work with nice people and it creates a terrific environment. Our clients come to the office and leave feeling positive and empowered. It's a terrific thing they're doing for themselves and their families by addressing their financial needs. And even if the news is bad, you know, again, I'm in, we're in the business of looking forward. And if you can get in front of something, you can make change and change the outcome. So even if things are complicated, you can have a terrific outcome. And the third reason they stay is most of the clients come and they've worried a little bit about something 365 days a year and not address it at all. So they wake up, they think about the things they want to do or the things they're worried about, their feet hit the floor and they can't get to any of it until they come back to bed and they repeat and repeat and repeat. And with us, 
you know, they know that we're not only going to address the issues on the onset, but nothing is ever going to go unaddressed again more than three months, right? So they have, they can call us whenever anything happens, a new job, a benefit package, their stock window opens, you know, a purchase is happening for real estate, whatever, but we're going to push in every three months and touch base with them. So it's a high touch practice. You know, our challenge is to find ways to deliver that service and that touch in a way that's efficient and can give us scale. So that's something that we're always working on. And so it's an interesting effect that uh, just the fact that you set this expectation, we're going to touch base every three months on an ongoing basis actually helps to prompt them to come up with things that they need to work on or talk about or, or want your help with, which then gives you an opportunity in the meeting to deal with that and help them with that, which then makes them feel good about working with you, which then perpetuates the cycle and the process. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, I think that clients, you know, our clients are busy, successful people who are good at what they do. Personal finance may not be in their bailiwick, but they don't have time to take care of themselves. And the fact that they, that they've delegated that responsibility for these check-ins to us, I think is something that gives most of our clients great comfort. So, so as you do this on an ongoing basis, does the, does the fee change? Do you do like a a higher fee in year one because you've got the additional planning work and then a reduced fee ongoing because you're, quote, just in the the ongoing quarterly meetings? Or is it just like the fees, the fee in year one and ongoing because we're just trying to smooth it out and make it sustainable? The latter. So again, okay. you know, the, we're doing the same meetings and the work, you know, yes, there's more diligence on the front end, but I've I've seen practices that charge the uh, bigger front end and then a reduced back end. And I, I just feel like it's easier for the client to smooth it out, to get it right the first time and then get them prepared. You know, I'm very, we're very open about the fee. So, you know, I, you know, explain what the fee is and we, we have this conversation and it, and I've had many people try to pitch me on meeting either in my own business or various industry folks on doing subscriptions. And I don't want, that to ha- I, I think the fee is very powerful. You know, the, the fee, this is a collaborative process. I'm not delivering a service to them. They're working with us so that they can have a better financial life. I, their participation is very important. And the fee is, is the thing that triggers that for them. So they p- pay the fee mm. up front for the year because I don't want them thinking about the fee throughout the year, right? They can, it'll be prorated if they ever decide to fire us. Nobody has, but if they want to, they can, and we will send it back. But I don't want them thinking about the fee throughout the year. And then when the renewal comes in, you know, even though we're paperless and many of us are in these industries, there's still lots of paper and some of these fees still have to be paid by check. And I kind of like, I'm really, I'm, I like the fact that a client has to find their checkbook. And for if you think of some of our technology clients, some of those folks don't even have checkbooks handy. They don't know how to write checks. But I want that process to be a process for them. And I tell them this in the meeting, I, in the first meeting, in the first get to know us meeting, like you, I want you to have to pull your checkbook out or figure out how you're going to pay us on the renewal and look at each other and say, has this been valuable? Has this been important for our family? Do we feel better? Do we feel more in control? Do we feel like we've addressed things that we hadn't addressed? Like, I want them to have that conversation. I want them to buy in when they're coming back to see us because they need to be part of the process. So we're very, very, we talk about the fee a lot. <laughs> and and what kinds of things are you doing on an ongoing basis? I mean, I, I'm just wondering, like, do you get clients where, hey, we're worked with you for a year or two or three, Alex, um, you know, really appreciate your advice. We're in a better place now. Just don't, don't really need you anymore. Like, I don't know what we're going to talk about over the next three and six and nine and 12 months. Feel like you already got us on a good track and solved our problems. It has happened at far less than you would think that I have had people say that, but again, we're, you know, I want this to be a place where people have direct and open conversation. You know, I say all the time, I, I can't say to somebody, Hey, I want you to be able to feel free to talk about your hopes, dreams, and aspirations for the future, your fears, your concerns, your anxiety about money. But let's not talk about our money. Let's not talk about the fees. I, you know, I tell people all the time, this has to be a free place to have an open conversation. And, and sometimes I say to them, you shouldn't pay the fee now. Like, take a break. You know, things are going to get more complicated and we're here when you want to come in. 
And we have had some folks that have said they want to take a break. And even sometimes I'm shocked, but of those folks, I would say at least 60% of them come back. So, you know, it's an open door. We're here. It's not, it's, we understand if somebody has to make a decision or they feel like, you know, if you're not getting value, I don't want a client to feel like they're not getting value here. That's not good for anybody. It's not good for the business. It's not good for them. It's not good for the brand that we're building. And, and how many clients do you have that are in this ongoing planning relationship? We probably have about a, I would say about 170. Okay. So it's a very sizable number. That's just a lot of a lot of people and you know, 170 clients times four meetings a year. I've got, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a whole lot of meetings that start adding up very quickly. It's 680 meetings for the year or, yeah. or touches since not everybody comes in and wants to go through Manhattan traffic. And working through that scale is, you know, it's an, it's something that we are looking at ongoing to make sure that we're finding the best and most efficient ways to do it. I will say that phone calls and video conferences have been great you know, most of the people that do what we do, we're chatty Cathy's. We like having conversations. We like people. We want to be with them and we want to talk about everything. And meetings can go really long. This shift to phone calls and video conferences, at least for a percentage of the meetings, is a lot more efficient because you're just, you don't, you know, a phone call, even a phone call that's got a lot of conversation in it can happen in 45 minutes where an in-person meeting can often go way longer, especially if I'm sitting in the meeting. <laughs> yeah, there is, there's an interesting effect. I, have, I had uh, noticed this in our firm a number of years ago when we started doing more video conference calls with clients, video meetings with clients, that the, like the average meeting time just went down. Mm-hmm. Not out of any intentional strategy, like, hey, let's do video meetings. I think I can cut these shorter than the in-person meetings. It, it it just happens. I, I feel like it's some combination of, as you said, like just we, we too still tend to chit chat, but maybe not quite as much in a video meeting as when someone comes in, it's got a little bit more of a, okay, we're all sitting in front of a camera for a reason. So like we can do some chit chat, then, then let's get to the reason why we're sitting in front of the camera and then we can get our stuff in and, and move on. And, and I think sometimes there's just this, at least I feel sometimes there's this time pressure effect that, you know, I mean, we're in the DC area. Traffic's pretty horrific here as well. And like, I, I can't have a client come across the bridge and out to the suburbs to our office for a for a twenty five minute meeting. Right. Like it 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 can take them an hour, an hour and a half round trip just to get from their home to our office and back again. And that's if they live eight miles away. So, like, I if they're going to invest that much in the time to come back and forth to the office, it's got to be a longer meeting. And so you know, I don't have any trouble filling the time and making it a longer meeting, but, but then ends up being a longer meeting that probably needed to be. Cause I just sort of felt subconsciously like we had to fill at least an hour because I feel bad if I sent them home after 25 minutes when it took them an hour and a half driving back and forth in the traffic. And all of that weight goes away when it's a video conference. Like, I don't know anybody who's ever come out of a video conference meeting was like, darn it. That meeting ended too fast. It was a short meeting. I thought I was going to get more time. Like, <laughs> No one complains. If the meeting runs its natural course and takes less time than expected, everybody just goes back about their day. If your in-person meeting takes less time than expected, at some point, someone's thinking like, why did I drive to the office for this meeting? It's it, why I mean, it was so short. It, you know, we have shorter commutes, thank God, in New York. But it, it is, it's, it really has happened naturally. And, and, it's been beneficial. So we've actually have started to incorporate a formula for, you know, if it's a $4,000 fee, we're going to do a couple of those meetings, either video conference or phone. And that's really helped us as far as being able to be as efficient as we can. And then it sounds like e-money and using e-money's account aggregation for plan updates and such is also a big part of trying to do this stuff efficiently for you? Oh, I mean, you can't do this. You know, the, the the heart of everything for all clients is cash flow. And quite honestly, the more someone makes and the more net worth they have, the less connected, the less in touch with their cash flow they are. They just don't understand their burn rate. And that feeds everything. That's really the engine for all of the different variations of what you're planning for. And there's absolutely no way to do this without technology. 
yeah, you you can't you know you can't get people to track their cash flow without technology, or or at least well the. A few people are really, really good at tracking the cash flow. They don't actually need our help uh, <laughs> because they're <laughs> on top of it. Everybody else who actually needs the help, like if we say, let's look at where your cash flow is going, like, well, I don't know. Like they, they don't know. So, you know, when the account aggregation technology just captures it and reports it, it's like, oh, there, there, there's where the money went. And, and they don't have to do any work aside from linking up accounts or relinking of the links break. Yeah. I, well, I mean, the links always break. So we set that expectation up front. There's maintenance, but we can't do the work we do without technology. And, you know, I think the the evolution of technology will be the one of the main factors with regard to scale. E-money is now, there's a component where they can actually enter a lot of the data into their own site themselves. So when we onboard a client, we're sending them that link. So in the old days, we had to key everything in and now they're keying, you know, you, we have a lot of younger technology clients. Not everybody does this, but if we can get, 40% of the population to do that, that's just going to help us as far as scale goes. So set, sending out the the data gathering module within eMoney so clients can just key in their own data. Yeah, very efficient. When I'm struck that you went so far as to say, like, we, we demo this in our prospect meetings. I know a lot of firms that, like, literally have tech demos in their prospect meetings with clients. Like what? What does that look like, or how do you? How are you positioning that to to prospects? It's a good way for them, you know, for a lot of folks who haven't done planning before or don't necessarily have that same perspective. It's a very good way to use a demo, if any technology that you're using, to be able to show them how you look at things, right? To say, I'm going to set the perspective. This is technology, you you get it, and it's shiny. The clients like the idea. Many of them that they have will have access to it, but it's really, and, and as I position it in the meeting, it's so that they understand what it looks like and feels like to be a client of ours and they understand what our perspective is. So the, the 30,000 foot view is evident. You're taking them through a balance sheet. You're showing them the cash flow. So this is what we're looking at when we're doing our cash flow analysis. We're projecting forward to your age 100, right? There are a lot of, there's a lot of trust in having those conversations. I mean, we're, we're getting in your head, right? At the conversation about your career arc, how long do you want to work? And where are you in your career? Is there a second act? What's going to happen? What are the expenses that we can reasonably predict will happen? And then what are the what if scenarios? What if I have the second act? What if there's a liquidity event? What if I want to buy real estate? How big, how much, what's my threshold? So I can take them through the technology where they can see it visually and they understand very quickly what our process looks like and and what we're going to be discussing in the planning process. And so where do where do clients come from for you? Or, or I guess where where do they come from originally? Because I'm sure now there's a good amount of once you after the first hundred plus clients referrals start coming in. But as as you were getting going, like where did where do clients come from into this you know, four to ten thousand dollar planning fee world before you could rely on referrals to make it happen? Back to my favorite word of this conversation: <laughs> networking, networking, networking. So it's really being out there. In the beginning, it was like you know hardcore. Now you were building a business from scratch, so you really just had to get out there and make make a community. And then, you know, I. I'm, I, I like meeting people and I like helping people. I'm very involved in my community and I've been involved in some professional organizations. And as my network grows, you know, I get connected to people. And so, so that's how that happened. I got into Google because I, my son went to the public elementary school in Chelsea in, in New York where I live, which is five blocks from Google. And we have a lot of Googlers there. And I was the PTA president and met some women who so was a lot of Googlers and somebody asked me to do a speaking gig when she realized what I was doing and how I was working. She was seeing me in action and asked me to do a panel at Google. And so those opportunities present themselves when you're sort of out in the real world doing things. And that's, that is really how a lot of the business was born and still today. So what, what surprised you the most about trying to build your own advisory business? Oh God. There's always a surprise, Michael. I think the best advice I'd give anybody who's early in their career is you just have to hang in. You know, I think 
I didn't realize that time is a factor for the success of a business of a business in this industry. And it is that, you know, growth capacity and your growth personally in the profession and then also the growth of your business. Time is, is, an, is an important component of it. It doesn't happen quickly and overnight. And then you sort of reach pivotal moments where the business sort of kicks into another gear. I think that, I mean, I think that was a surprise. I think, you know, we're dealing with all the challenges anybody deals with as the business grows. You know, we've, we've reached inflection points. We're at one now. Staffing is always an issue. We're hiring. So if anybody's out there. What's the inflection now that you're, you're hitting? We are at the, at another growth inflection point. So we, we've had terrific growth over the course of the business. Last year, we sort of looked at the business and did some restructuring because we realized we'd gotten to a a point where we needed to work on scale and efficiency for the business as we ready for the next leg of growth on the business. And so, so that's sort of what we're laying the foundation for. So we're, you know, bringing in more staff, preparing me to, you know, again, get more to the business of, you know, building the business and being out in the universe so that, I would say that's it. I mean, we, we just we, we just another a growth point for the business that we have to address. And and so what's the what's the pain point that you're trying to solve for? It's it's the pressure on your time. Yes, it is, and you know, it's also. I mean, I will come back to staffing. Staffing is is complicated. It's finding good people, and as you build a business, especially in a market where human capital is expensive, like in New York. You know, finding people that you can build in the business and help grow. I'm very proud of the fact that in the 12 years we've had this business, we've been almost all women almost all the time. And every woman that's come through our doors is still in the business. And that's something, Some the, the love of the industry and of planning has taken root. But, you know, when you're starting a business where human capital is expensive, you often have to get people in the early stages of their career, which will, in, you know undoubtedly mean that that you were a a stopping point along their career arc. And so as the business has grown, you know, now we're at a point where we are looking at our staffing needs in a different way than we did even five, six years ago. And so that, that is very exciting. And what's the, what's the shift? Like you, you don't want to hire as young with the risk that they're going to move on once they get to a different point in their career and you want to hire more experienced instead. Or going the other direction. I, I'm very happy to bring people into this business, especially women, because I think there's so much. I mean, obviously, there's room for many, many more women in this business. The percentages should be very different. And I don't, you know, I think that being able to see the landscape of opportunities in this business is something that is really terrific and something that we love making aware people aware of. You can be a plan. You can, if you are somebody that doesn't want to build clients, you can be an in-house planner and you can work with clients that way. You can be the analytic person who never has to deal with people. You could be somebody that wants to build a book of business. You can be in a big place. You can be in your own place. There's just so many different avenues. And I think women are fine tuned to be in this business. So we're happy to bring people at the early stages of their career in, but you know, the nature of, the business is as you grow, you have the capacity to be able to pay for more experienced talent. And so, you know, that's, that's just the nature of the growth of the business. So that, you know, that's something that you're always looking at. And we'd love to grow people internally as well. And so, you know, you're looking at the full landscape. And, and what's the role you're actually hiring for at this point? We're hiring planners and paraplanners. All those client meetings, we need to cover them. <laughs> so not necessarily, as you were sort of saying a, a moment ago, maybe not necessarily roles that have to do business development because you're trying to free up your time to do that. These are like, we have 170 clients that need 680 meetings a year. We need someone to do those. Like, Yeah, and more. Serve, service the heck out of these clients. Right. Yeah. And as, as we, you know, grow, obviously even more, and we're also very receptive to give somebody a home who wants to build their business and build, you know, a client base and have a structure and infrastructure that gives them that, that foundation, especially if planning is something that's important to them, because that's really what we are. Well, so uh, for folks that are listening, this is episode 169. So if you go to 
kitsis.com slash 169. We will have links to the show notes out to Alex's firm. So if you actually are in the Manhattan area looking for opportunities, um, hopefully serendipity will strike. <laughs> Alex, so what is what is a typical week look like for you at this point? Is there a, a standard structure or flow to what you do? I'm seeing clients, you know, one of the benefits of being in New York we have clients come to us. So, they, you know, every client comes to the office or is on a phone call or a video conference. But we can see a lot of people because the commute, there is no, really the commute is so different than yours, Michael. And I'm so sorry for yeah. your commute. I, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> pretty ugly. Uh, DC area is consistently top three worst traffic city in the, in the country, usually right there with LA and, and Atlanta. But we have nice city amenities if you, you know, <laughs> as long as you don't mind spending a lot of time getting to them. One of the things about New York is you get immediate satisfaction. And my, my Joan used to laugh because I would I would jokingly say, if it takes me 45 minutes to get someplace, should I really be there in the first place? I can, <laughs> I can get anywhere I need to in New York in faster time than that. Yeah, DC, like, oh, if it only takes me 45 minutes, like, awesome. It was only 10 miles away. <laughs> so, you know, we're in the office you know, the, the clients are coming here. So I'm in the office seeing clients, you know, every morning is, is, you know, when you recap the day, what's the business look like? And, you know, what am I doing? Some of the management related pieces of the business are the first thing I start my day off with. And then. So you do that as like literally a daily meeting every morning. What are, what are we working on today? I do that. The first thing I do, one of the first things I do in the morning before I even get out of the house is I sort of surveil what's happening. What's the calendar look okay. like? What are, you know, some of the things that I have to deal with from a business perspective? You know, what are some of the issues that we have to deal with administratively? We have an office, an executive assistant, an office manager here who takes care of the day-to-day stuff, but it's really more of the the management pieces. We do have at least one weekly meeting where it's a team meeting, and that come everybody comes in for about an hour to an hour and a half. Sometimes it's longer. Where we go through everybody, we go through all the clients. What are some of the? And we don't hit every single client, but every person in the office gets to talk about their hit list. What are some of the things that are happening? Are there any issues with any clients that we need to know about? You know, we're we have a terrific CRM system, so we do and can track everything if a client need comes up. But this is a good way for us to hit the hot topics. And, and what's the CRM system for tracking all of this? It's actually, that's one of the benefits of working with Commonwealth. <laughs> they have their own, their own CRM system that they built. Yeah. Okay. So weekly meeting, weekly kind of team meeting, here's all the stuff we're doing with either, I guess, client meetings or just client servicing stuff we're working on and dealing with. Yeah. And then anything that's happening internally, if we work as a team. So making sure that everybody is communicating and getting everything they need clearly and that happens in that meeting. So it's, it sets the stage. We try to have that meeting every Monday afternoon. It does move around sometimes if there are client emergencies, but we really do try to keep it on Monday afternoons. And what was the low point for you on the journey? It would sound crazy if I said there weren't many. I mean, you know, there. They, if, listen, I, I'm an entrepreneurial cheerleader, I, and I say that's what we do for our clients. But I, I walk the walk because I've walked, I've owned or run businesses my entire life, privately held business. You know, you have to have great faith and a cast iron constitution because there are days <laughs> that are terrifying. Right? I, we have a, a very big overhead in New York. You know, we have staff salaries and rent that needs to be paid and you know, people depend on you. And so there are days where you're thinking, wow, why did I do this? <laughs> but the entrepreneurial drive, you know, gets you through those moments. And that's, that's part of the package of having your own business. That's, that's part of the ride. It's not, not everyone's meant for it. It's, it is there. Those terrifying moments can be absolutely terrifying, but they come with the terrain, right? It's, it's, it's the way it is in any business. And I've, you know, it's not just this business. There are other businesses, but starting and running your own thing, you, you're the buck stops with you. You know, you've got to make sure everything happens. So I would say it's just the normal wear and tear of, you know, transitioning and growing a business. Anything you wish you'd done differently as you, as you look back, or I guess like, what do you know now you wish you could tell you from 10 years ago as you were getting ready to make the transition to Commonwealth and an independent firm? to be on a good track. It's so funny. You know, again, I'm not a backward looking person. 
I often think it, it, it does work out that the, the journey was part of the success. Hmm. I think that the discomfort of being, you know, the only woman brought me into a network of people where I found a terrific business partner. We have a terrific business relationship that's going to build this business to great success and has already. The discomfort of being, you know, in an insurance, you know, in a, in a product centric environment drove us the pain of that and the knowledge that we wanted to be planning brought us to a planning practice very early. I mean, we've been planning for 11, 12 years. So in, in a, at a time where, you know, some people have been doing it even longer, but it wasn't that common. And it, it, it that drove us to get it out there and get it done. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would do much differently, honestly. I, I just like that framing that the journey is part of the success and, and the, the discomfort and pain points that we get into from time to time in the business are actually the things that ultimately tend to shape the positive ways that the business ends up going in the future with, with I guess, the caveat that some people get, I call it like they get discomforted and stuck. The difference for you is you get, dis, you got discomforted and then lifted up to do something about it. And the thing you did about the discomfort ended up leading to the next stage of the, the business or the cycle. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's how progress happens. And I think again, for some, for me, tomorrow is very exciting. <laughs> so you've got to get to tomorrow. You know, sometimes you just got to get through today and what happened yesterday, you know, it either got you to a place you want to be at, or it's part of getting you to that place. So it sounds kind of hokey, but it's worked so far. <laughs> yeah. So any other advice you would give to younger advisors or just newer advisors, career changing in to who are trying to start a firm today? Besides, don't forget how much time is a factor. So make sure you can stay in the game. <laughs> yes. Yes. Get some great resources, you know, find out what you don't know. So there's lots of ways that you can be more efficient. There, again, to my point, there are lots of different ways to be in this business. So there is not one way or one path. And, you know, there are so many different variations of practices that people focus on a variety of different things. I think the knowledge that the universe is much bigger than the singular experiences one may have is super important. So if you go into a place and they're not doing the kind of business that gets you excited before you decide that that's it for you, I would look around and sort of understand that there are different ways that you can be in this business and network, right? I mean, that's, I, I think, you know, the key to so many things is really building a good network of people and, and people that will help you understand what's happening in your industry and keep you current, people that will help you grow your business, people that will, you know, help support you on those days where you're thinking, why am I doing this? Um, you know, I think that that is super important and, and understanding that you have to give, you know, more than you get right? So you have to be a connector. You have to be able to help other people too. And if you do, then they will, you know, the returns will be multiples of that. So for someone who's newer and coming in, where, where would you start on the networking end? Like where, where do I go? What do I join or do? When I started, I mean, I did have a, a market, but I knew I needed to meet more professionals, more people. So I did like all the networking things one could do. I joined it. I joined you know, a variety of different networking groups to build my core foundation. I think that's what you do. You know, you, you really, you start to realize that you need to build a network and you need to have the people that can help support your business, the professionals that will help you. And then people that will help round out sort of what you're doing. And you, you know, it's old school. You have to just be out there talking to people, letting them know what you're doing, finding out what they're doing and seeing how you can all help each other. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is I mean, just the word success means different things to different people. So you're, you're building on this fantastic trajectory for the firm and already a quarter of a billion dollars under management and you know, what I think I want to objectively call a very successful business. But how do you define success for yourself at this point? Success 
for me is, is being able to have the freedom to keep doing this. You know, I, I say all the time, I, I love this work. I think it's noble. And I think what we do is so honorable. I mean, I want to be in an afternoon client meeting of my evening funeral. Like I, I can't imagine ever not doing this. And the older you get, the better you get, right? Your wisdom is growing multiples over time, which is another tidbit for anybody that's out there, especially women, you know, having your own entity in a business where you can age well, there's lots of things that are good about that. So you can be a woman and work as long as you want to, and you can work as long as you want to. So that, that holds for both men and women. So it's doing this and growing it. And there is some, you know, great success in being able to see the business grow and not just for the sake of the numbers, but also the understanding that people have found value in the work, right? And, and that's why it's growing. That I think makes us feel successful here. And being able to launch so many women in the industry has been a really important thing for us. We're very happy with our record and we want to keep doing that. Well, very cool. Very cool. And, uh, you know, hopefully the, the next person or the next opportunity is listening and we'll, we'll give you a call after this episode. <laughs> and we can continue to, to pay it forward and, and propagate it forward. Thank you so much. Well, absolutely. Thank you, Alex, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.